Corporate Finance Excel Practice Problem. In this presentation, we're going to work a practice problem in Excel related to customer credit policy decision in which we're making a decision as to whether we want to lower the credit policy criteria for customers in order to make a sale, which could increase the sales because we might have more customers that way, but we'll also have more credit risk. The risk of us not being able to collect, say, on the accounts receivable then going up, balancing those two factors, get ready. It's time to take your chance with corporate finance. Here we are in Excel. We have our information on the left-hand side. We're going to put that into the blue area into the worksheet on the right-hand side. Note that we do have two tabs down below. You may have four tabs if you're working along with us. Two tabs will be the answer key on your tab on your sheet. We only have the two tabs for the practice where we're going to be working through the problems. The second tab will have a similar problem, although it will be substantially different. It'll be a similar type of problem, a little bit longer here. So we will be working through both those going back to the first tab. We have our information on the left, which says option to extend credit to more customers previously thought of as poor risk. So this is the question as to whether we should loosen up the credit policy standards. If we're selling to customers and we're trying to say we're trying to weed out those customers that we don't want to sell to due to the fact that we don't think we'll be able to collect on the receivable after we sell to them. We could say, hey, why don't we loosen those restrictions? And that would mean that we would be catching more customers. We'd be picking up more customers, but also would be at risk to be picking up the types of customers that may not be paying off the receivable. And it could increase the cost of us having to go through the collection process uh, in order to try to, uh, to be collecting on the receivable. So how would we go about making a decision as to what the proper place is for our credit policy uh, our po credit policy to maximize the sales. So we might say, hey, look, we're going to think about loosening the credit policy, making it easier for uh, people to to be purchasing our products. And that would we were going to say that that's we're going to estimate that that will increase the sales by 140,000. Obviously, these are projections out into the future. So we'd have to be, you know, doing some tests on this to see what would be the, the best option. So we'll have to be using estimates to think about what's going to be happening. That's why you also want to take a, sh a look at your sheet to make sure that you have the information on the left-hand side or something like this so that you can easily then change the data to make different assumptions about what could possibly happen in the future and then and adjust your projections uh, accordingly. So the rate of accounts receivable estimated to be uncollectible or the accounts receivable or sales, we're going to say these are all credit sales, so that means that uh, we're going to say 6% of them are going to be uncollectible, we believe. The additional cost, the additional collection costs as a percentage of sales. So of that 140000 it's going to cost us another 3%, we believe, in order to go through the collection process. Because these sales are going to have to go through the accounts receivable. Uh, and then we're going to have to collect on them. And they may be a little bit more challenging than other <laughs> sales to be collecting on. And then the production and selling costs as a percentage of sales will be 75%. So when we do the production and selling process, you, that's going to be a standard uh, normally, uh, you know, a high percentage of um, the sales and often will vary or change along with the sales. And then the tax bracket we're going to say is 15%. So then if we were going to work out and say, let's run this scenario and see what this would look like. Let's basically put together an income statement and figure out the after the, the after taxes uh, income, basically an income statement. So we're going to say, and we're only going to be recording the increase, right? We're going to say, okay, there's an increase in sales of that 140,000. We're going to have some component of them that we think are going to be uncollectible. So uncollectible, let's just call it uh, uncollectible receivables, uncollectible sales or receivables. So we can say AR just to make it clear here. Now, we might call that in accounting, we might call that when we actually um, record the uncollectible amounts like bad debt expense or something like that. But I want to make it clear in our estimate that these are the sales that we don't think we're going to be collecting on that are not really sales, right? So I want to put that up top because this is the, you know, a key factor that we're focusing in on. When we do the actual accounting for generally accepted accounting principles, we'll typically record it basically as an expense of bad debt expense. But really, it's a negation you know of these sales in essence right these sales weren't really sales if we're not going to be able to collect the money on the sales so that's going to be then the equal to the 140,000 times the six percent and that's i'm going to put an underline here home tab font group and underline i'm going to call this net sales net sales increase 
So this is the net increase in sales after taking into consideration the amount of sales that aren't really sales because we don't think we're going to be able to collect on them is going to be the 140,000 minus the 800 uh, 8,400. Again, net sales may not always include the uncollectible. When you see the term net sales uh, in financial statements, it might be basic sales minus discounts and returns and allowances uh, rather than and then bad debt may not be grouped in net sales. But again, you can kind of think of bad debt as basically something that would negate uh, the sale. So that's how I want to think about it here when considering this decision making process. And then we're going to have the collection costs. So we have the collection costs which we said is going to be a percentage of the sales so 140,000 times the additional collection costs which are going to be three percent and that's going to be the 4,200 then we have the production and selling costs which are typically the large uh, components of the costs right that's going to be equal to the 140,000 times the 75 percent production and selling costs. I'm going to subtract this out. This is going to give us our uh, increase in income before taxes. So let's put that down here. Increase in income before taxes. I'm going to put an underline here, home tab font group underline, subtracting this out. So this is going to be equal to the 131.6 minus the 4002 minus the 105. We could do that by embedding a sum function too. So you might do it this way. I'll do it over here. This equals this number minus the sum of brackets and then these two numbers and then you got to close up the brackets shift zero so that's another way might be a little bit more fancy looking kind of way to do that a little bit more impressive type of way to embed the sum function so then we're going to say that there's going to be an increase in the taxes which is going to be that 22,400 times the tax rate which we said was the 15 percent and that's going to give us the uh, increase in income after taxes. So the increase in income after taxes will be equal to the 22.4 minus the 3,360. Let's put an underline here. We're going to the home tab, font group, and underline. And there we have it. So we have the 1940. So it looks like we have an, a, a positive uh, result of this change. So you think that would be a good thing to do. We can then think about, well, what is the return that we're getting on this? What's the return? rate of return we could say well there's an increase in the income after taxes of the 19,040 and we had the sales up top is going to be equal to the 140,000 so then the return on sales is going to be equal to the 1940 divided by the 140,000 we're going to percentify this going through the home tab percentage i'm going to add a couple decimals let's put an underline as well under the 140,000 home tab font group and underline okay let's do a similar kind of problem here on the second tab we'll have it a little bit more complex with our data here so we have the we have, once again we have the option to extend credit to more customers previously thought of as poor risk so we're going to do the same kind of scenario our data we have the percent of sales estimated as uncollectible we think it's 11 percent as uncollectible now the collection costs as a percent of the new sales it's going to cost us two percent of the new sales for collection costs the production and selling costs as a percentage of sales, 85%. Accounts receivable turnover is going to be 4. And then we have the income tax rate is going to be 25%. And the uh, sales increase is going to be 105. There's going to be no other asset buildup as we think through the problem. Let's first consider our accounts receivable increase. We're going to need this when we then think about our return on investment. So the increase in accounts receivable we can look at, we can figure with the accounts receivable turnover that we have here. Now note when we're thinking about the accounts receivable, we're thinking about something that is on the financial statements. So oftentimes when you start to think about the, the kind of calculations that you would be doing, you typically use the financial statements to make a calculation for something not on the financial statements such as the accounts receivable turnover. So when, when you're using, when you're trying to figure something out that would be on the financial statements projecting into the future, you might then want to, to use the actual formula for the accounts receivable turnover and then back into the missing data. All right, that might be a new, otherwise you're going to be thinking about how are you going to memorize a new formula? Otherwise you get into the, the, the idea that you have to memorize a new formula for every amount that's on the financial statements. But really you can, you can just memorize the formula for the accounts receivable turnover 
and then we're going to be backing into that piece that will be the unknown, in our case, the accounts receivable turnover. So you could think about it this way. You could say, well, we have the sales increase. I'm going to look at the accounts receivable turnover calculation, which is the sales increase divided by the accounts receivable uh, increase. That's going to be our normal uh, accounts receivable turnover type of calculation. Uh, let's say accounts receivable. I'm going to I'm going to paste this here. Accounts receivable increase. So the sales increase is going to be the 105. We don't know this number, so that's going to be our unknown. So I'm going to say that's going to be what we're looking for. We do know the end result, which is going to be the four here, and that's going to be the accounts receivable turnover. Accounts receivable turnover. So that means that uh, we can we can divide this out. This should be this divided by the four is going to be our plug. So we can figure that out algebraically. Obviously, we can write it down then and figure out the algebra here. So I would think of it vertically, then write it down algebra if you need to. Home tab, font group, and then underline. We can double check that by saying, okay, does this make sense? The 105,000 divided by the 26,250. That does equal the four. Now, if you were to look at the answer, like an, like an answer key to a book or something like that, or if you were to rewrite this and try to explain it, most likely you would say, well, then we have to do the accounts receivable inquiries formula, you know? which isn't really a formula it's just because you don't you don't typically memorize that you typically memorize this formula right but if you were going to rewrite it it would look something like this we would say the sales this is going to be equal to the sales increase which is going to be the 105 and then we're going to have the accounts receivable turnover the accounts receivable turnover which is going to be 4 and that's going to give us the accounts receivable increase which is going to be equal to the 105 divided by the four let's put an underline under the four here home tab font group underline just another way to get to that same 26 uh 250. now let's think about our increase in income after taxes basically our income statement for the incremental increase that we're expecting from this we're going to start off with the sales increase that's going to be equal to this 105 down here. Then we've got the uncollectible sales, or AR, right? This is the accounts receivable that would be uncollectible, like the bad debt. But I want to record it here because this is going to be the place where we're going to be focusing in on. That's going to be the 105 times the 11% we think is going to be uncollectible. Home tab font group underline. That's going to give us basically our net increase in sales which is going to be equal to the 105 minus the 11 uh, 550 that's going to give us the 93 450 then we have the collection costs it's going to cost us a little bit more to collect on these ones right that's going to be the 105 times the collection costs of the two percent and then we have the production and selling costs the production and selling costs and that's going to be equal to the 105,000 times the 85 percent let's put an underline there by going to the home tab font group and underline and that'll give us our increase in income before taxes which is going to be equal to the 93,450 minus the 2,100 minus the 89,250 so we get the 2100 and then we have the taxes increase the increase in the taxes then it's going to be that amount the 2100 times the 25 percent to give us to get us to the increase in income after taxes which is going to be equal to the 2100 minus the 525 so let's put an underline there so we do have an increase uh, for that now we can think about our return on, on investment let's think about the um, increase in income after taxes increase in income after taxes is going to be the 1575 and we're going to compare that to the accounts receivable the accounts receivable that we calculated up top so we've got the accounts receivable asset of the 20 uh, 6250 and we're looking at our return on that so this is going to be equal to the 26250 
So that's going to give us our return on investment, which is going to be equal to the 1575 divided by the 26250. Let's percentify that cell by going to the home tab numbers group, percentifying it. And then let's uh, underline the 26250 uh, home tab font group and underline. Then we have our data to the right, which says calculate the incremental investment in accounts receivable and inventory needed to support the increase in sales. So we have the inventory turnover to be helping out with that, which is two. So we want to be thinking about then uh, the incremental inventory that we might be needing. So once again, if we're thinking about the inventory, then you're talking about something that would be on the financial statement. So we typically, in, you know, calculate something like the inventory turnover from things on the financial statement. Therefore, you could try to reverse, you know, the calculation, which we'll, we'll look, about, look at, but you don't typically need to have a new formula to figure out something on the financial statements. You can basically back into it by using the inventory turnover formula. So the inventory turnover formula we're going to use is going to be the sales increase. Uh, sales in and now remember when we looked at these inventory turnover formulas or all these turnover formulas in a prior section, you, you saw that there were a couple variants on the on the inventory turnover that might be using cost of goods sold or it might be using sales we're going to be using sales here for our inventory turnover calculation that's going to be the 105 and if you like i said if you want more detail on all those um, uh, these ratios in general we got a whole section a bunch of problems describing those here so we won't go into a lot of detail with that so then we have the incremental uh in inventory so we've got the uh, incremental inventory or the inventory that's the unknown that's what we don't know and then we have the inventory turnover which we do know inventory turnover which is two that's going to be two so that means we can back into the to the 105 we can write it down algebraically now if we so choose and i'm going to i'm going to say that would be the 105 divided by two let's put an underline here home tab font group underline so that's going to be our inventory, uh, the incremental inventory. Now, if I was to recalculate this, this would be the 105 divided by 2, and that's going to give us our inventory turnover. Now, again, if we were to, to write that down as a formula to find the incremental inventory, we would just be basically be doing the algebra. This is what you would basically see if you were trying to explain this to someone. They'd, they'd probably explain it to you by basically giving you the incremental inventory as if it's a new new formula that you kind of have to learn. But really, you probably want to think of it as uh, just memorizing the inventory turnover formula and doing the algebra. But if you were going to write it down this way, it'd be something like the sales increase, which would be the 105, the 105, and then we have the inventory turnover. Let's just say equals the inventory turnover of two. We can put an underline here, home tab font group, and underline, and that's going to be our in incremental inventory which will be equal to the 105,000 divided by 2 and that's going to be the 52.5 so now if, if we think about our return on investment the return on investment now looking at the investment being the inventory the incremental inventory and the accounts receivable those being the assets that we can think about the return on those assets we can then say all right we have our our increase in income after taxes which is now the 1575 and then we've got the, the total investment which is going to be equal to the 525 asset in investment and the 26250 that's going to be the 78750 that's going to give us our return on investment which is going to be equal to the 1575 divided by the 78,250. Uh, going to percentify the cell, home tab numbers group percentifying it, and I think it's even, so we're good there. And I'm I'm going to then put an underline up top, uh, home tab font group and underline.